So um, before we get started, I wanted to get a feel for the audience here. So who would consider themselves a software developer or you're trying to become a software developer? Okay, that is most of the room. Who would consider themselves a data professional of some kind? About half the room. Uh, who would consider themselves in uh, some kind of leadership role at their company? A couple, um, maybe about a third of the room. Awesome, and uh, everyone else, everyone else, raise your hand if, if you didn't raise your hand yet. All right, hey Caleb, good to see you. So excited to have everyone here. So really quickly, my name is Kristen Ferrier, a little bit older than I actually look, so I have 18 plus years experience in IT. I'm principal consultant and owner at Ferrier Solutions, and I'm a full stack web developer with a specialty and passion for data. The front end development I've done lately has been in React. On the data side, I'm doing actually a lot with Power BI right now. These are my socials and they will be up in the end and also the slides for this presentation sometime in the next couple of days will be actually tweeted out. I know I sometimes like to take pictures of slides and a few of them we're just gonna have to fly by. So on Twitter, I'm SQL Energy, Tacklehama Slack, Energy Dev, and on GitHub, I am also Energy Dev. All right, so who here got into databases did that beep come from this? Okay. Who here got into, data, um, into information technology 10 or more years ago? That looks like maybe 60% of the room. Who got into less than 10 years ago? All right, about half the room. Who got in five years ago or less? Just only about five people, so that's actually a smaller number than I was expecting. So if you think back to 10 to 15 years ago in software development, and the discussion of databases, which database should we use? Oftentimes there were really only two that we were talking about. Oracle and SQL Server were really the two that were getting talked to and ooh, wow, what if someone talked about Postgres or MySQL or open source? Like that wasn't really something getting talked about a lot. And maybe about a two thirds of companies were looking for Oracle experience and about a third SQL Server. My SQL Server experience got me lots of jobs because other people were learning Oracle and they couldn't find the SQL Server people. So that was 10 to 15 years ago. It was pretty straightforward. We're like, oh, Oracle, SQL Server, maybe get into some kind of battle debate on that. This is now. There are literally hundreds of database options that we can pick from. And within about the last five to 10 years, we've started to hear about this, this no SQL movement. And there are a lot of great no SQL databases, but it can also be very, very confusing because the definition of NoSQL varies with people. Maybe you've worked with a NoSQL database. You think all NoSQL databases are similar because all relational databases are similar. And as you can see up on the screen here, databases actually come in all sorts of different sizes and different shapes. So the purpose of this talk is to basically make everyone a lot less confused about the database spectrum. So we're first of all, we're gonna briefly talk about the difference between an SQL database and no SQL databases. Then we're gonna talk about something called ACID, which is something you may or may not want in your database. Then the bulk of the talk is we're gonna talk about the five main database families. Some people call them genres. Then we're gonna talk about the most popular members of those families. And then we're gonna talk about when you want to use them. Now there are actually more than five families but there's five main ones that people typically talk about. So let's do a quick talk between SQL and NoSQL. First of all, who has worked with an SQL database? Most of the room. Who hasn't worked with an SQL database in this room? One or two people, okay. Who has worked with a NoSQL database? Much of the room, much of the room. Who's worked with what they know is a document database? Mongo, Firebase, real-time database, Couchbase, okay, awesome. Couchbase, by the way, is a document database and they are here as the vendor and you can go ask them questions at their booth. I think they may have someone in here as well. Who's worked with a columnar database? Couple hands, graph, all right, couple hands, all right. So SQL databases and a lot, of, I've, I'm used to talking in places and people haven't really worked with SQL databases, but we are gonna go ahead and cover them, especially because there may be features they have that we don't necessarily realize aren't in all other databases. So SQL databases are also known as relational databases. So a SQL database and a relational database, they're pretty much the same thing. 
They store data in tables. Now, those tables are considered math relations. Now, what a math relation is, it's outside the scope of this talk. But columnar databases also have tables, but they're not math relations. They're a completely different kind of table. And you use SQL to interact with the data. No SQL. There's not one specific definition out there for no SQL, and that's where it can get confusing. So the second one that we have is actually the simplest one. You've got SQL and everything else, and everything else is no SQL. And that is a definition that's starting to gain a lot of popularity right now. There's a major databases talk on free code camp where that's the definition that's put out there. So for some people, it, you've got SQL, everything else, everything else is no SQL. But for some people, it's a little bit more specific. That, fir that first definition, which came off the internet, it's paraphrased from the internet, purpose built, and I emphasize purpose built. Some people love data, some people don't like data. They don't wanna deal with it. But if you don't like data, that doesn't mean you just wanna go to a NoSQL database. Especially with NoSQL databases, you wanna make sure you're using the right kind of database. So another definition is purpose built databases for specific data models with an emphasis on flexible schemas and the new demands of modern applications. So let's talk about ACID. Who here has a bank account? Or they have money somewhere? All right. So we're gonna talk about ACID and financial transactions. So atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability are the four tenets of ACID. Now if you're familiar with a relational database, it should have the capability to be ACID compliant. So a relational database also equals capability to be ACID compliant. So if you've only worked with a relational database, you may be used to your database having this functionality. There needs to be a realization that if you go into the NoSQL spectrum of things, you may or may not have ACID compliance. And full ACID compliance in the NoSQL spectrum is, is, is somewhat rare. So let's talk about atomicity. So April, she has two bank accounts, she takes $1,000 and she transfers it to another bank account. Now it would probably be really disappointing to April if the $1,000 got pulled from account A and didn't get put into, B, into account B, because she, then she'd lose $1,000. So atomicity is basically saying this unit of work of the pull of $1,000 and a push of $1,000 has to execute completely at all or not at all. So atomicity says the transfer happened or the transfer didn't happen, but there's never gonna be a state in between where you could see an in-between state. Now consistency, now I'll mention if you've heard of CAP theorem, consistency there is not the same as consistency here. This is the, the least interesting of them, but it's basically saying that data has to conform to your schema. So if we've got bank accounts and we have a foreign key constraint that says, hey, if we deposit money into an account, it has to actually exist. If we try and deposit into an account that exists, it'll work. If we try and deposit into an account that doesn't work, that doesn't exist, it's not gonna work. That's called consistency. Isolation, another example of where we could lose money if we don't have isolation. Basically saying transactions must leave the database in a state as if they were executed sequentially. So let's say April is taking $1,000 from account A to account B and during that time, Kaler decides to withdraw $500 from account B. So the end result should be account A, $2,000, account B, $2,500. We don't have isolation, we could lose $1,000. So each side is a, is a transaction, they're starting at different times. We're trying to read account B at the same time, both transactions get account B is $2,000. The first one's adding in $1,000 and gives account B $3,000. The second one's pulling 500 from what it thinks is 2,000. And so now we've lost $1,000 because we don't have isolation. So here's an example where we don't lose the money. Both sides are trying to read account B at the same time. One side gets told, sorry, you're gonna have to wait a little bit, waits a couple of milliseconds, gets access to account B, has $3,000, pull $500, and you have $2,500. Durability, that's basically saying that once the transaction has been successful, it needs to be persisted. I say again, it has to be persisted in a way that's recoverable. So April transferred $1,000 from account A to account B. The servers crash or some kind of software failure, we still know about the transfer. We may have to restore from a backup, but we still have the capability to know about the transfer. Now once we start to get into no SQL spectrum of things, you may or may not have ACID compliance. So that's one thing to be aware of. Now that, that may be okay. 
if we all tweeted a couple of tweets in the next 30 seconds and then something happened with one of the Twitter servers and our tweets got lost, not, not a huge deal, not a huge deal. Even if it wasn't recoverable, even if it wasn't durable, not a big deal. But if we put money into our bank account and something happens 30 seconds later, we're gonna expect that the data actually be there. So let's talk about the five different database families. So based on previous conversation or experience, who can list off some database families? Document. Graph. Columnar. Key value. Relational. Can anyone mention some that we haven't talked about here? Any others that they might have heard of? No. Object oriented, okay. It's also time series, time series. I haven't had a chance to look into it. That's actually making a big push right now. And I believe in memory and search are a couple of popular ones as well. So we're gonna talk about the five main ones, but there's actually a lot more. So five main database families that we're gonna talk about and some of the major players. I'll leave this up for anyone that wants to take a slide, real, slide picture real quick. All right. So SQL or relational, so I'm probably not gonna spend quite as much time on this since most people here have worked with SQL databases. So here are some of the major players and I have added MariaDB to this list as well because it's making a play and getting a lot of attention. I'm hearing a lot about Postgres lately. Postgres and MariaDB I'm hearing a lot about from the open source side and SQL Server I'm still hearing a lot about for the, the more of a paid product side of things. So in a relational database, data lives in tables. A lot of us are familiar with that with rows and columns, like in a spreadsheet. Now one thing we may not really think about that you're not necessarily gonna have in some NoSQL databases is those columns actually have a data type, like an integer or a string kind of type, such as varchar. Each table has an exact number of rows at a specific time. So this table has four columns in it. Every single row has four columns in it. We're not gonna have one row with three, one row with seven, one row with two. You actually see that with columnar though. And the table structure must be defined prior to adding data. If you wanna have data, you need to actually put it into your tables first of all. Data is accessed using SQL. Now, it may seem kind of strict that you've gotta have a schema before you put data in it, but using joins, we tie our data together from our tables in lots and lots of different ways, providing a lot of flexibility. So not only do we have ACID compliance with our relational database, we also have a lot of flexibility in our queries. So a relational overview, you design your schema ahead of time with types, you can query the data with lots of flexibility, and it's ACID compliant. So relational databases are very, very popular for online transaction processing, OLTP. Things like order entry, financial transactions, retail sales, very popular for data warehousing as well. Now, relational is very popular for a lot of things, and there are some people that are in the industry that, that basically say, hey, if you're not gonna get to beyond a half a terabyte really, really quickly, just stick with relational databases, unless you have a specific need to pull away from relational databases. So that's not necessarily what I personally go by, but I know some people that, that that's very much what they believe. And it's, it's good to take a good look at whether or not relational is a good option for what you're trying to do. It's not so great for massive amounts of data, for petabytes of data. If you're wanting to rapidly, rapidly ingest huge amounts of data and you don't even know the structure, relational is not gonna be a very good option for you. And it's not gonna be very good for scaling out or horizontal scaling. Now one of the things with the database world that we're living in, and we have all of these different families, I'm teaching you about all these different families, is, is some databases are actually multi-model, they're members of multiple families, and then certain databases are adding on functionality beyond their original functionality. So if you have a relational database and you want to have JSON data, you don't actually have to switch from a relational database. Postgres, SQL Server, MySQL, and Oracle all either have JSON data types 
or JSON functionality, I have a completely separate SQL Server talk that's available from my Twitter account, there's a video to it, of just the JSON functionality in SQL Server. And SQL Server also has R capability and Python capability. So our relational databases, they are so much more than what they used to be just even five or 10 years ago. So if there's, uh, really, if you're, I've even heard some people saying that they're pulling away from document databases in cases where they just wanted JSON data because they have it in relational databases now. So document databases, who's worked with document databases? What have you guys worked with? Mongo? Anyone something other than Mongo? Couchbase? Any Firebase? CouchDB? Any of the others? All right, Mongo is clearly the one getting the most. So here are some of the major players for document databases. So in a document database, your data lives in a document, such as JSON or XML. And that provider, such as Mongo, Mongo, it's JSON documents. Couchbase, I believe it's JSON documents. If you were gonna have XML documents, that'd be a different provider. And I think at least the top four document database providers now are storing data in JSON. So you have a document key, it corresponds to your document. In this case, we've got an episode of TNT's The Librarians, I think it's the pilot episode in JSON format. You can store nested objects within the document. You would typically store all data for a single object in that single document. So this data in a relational database would typically be across tables. You'd probably have a characters table, an actors table, a franchise table, an episodes table, a director's table, and you'd tie those all together in some way. In this case, that data is all in this document. You have some duplication of data in some other document. And you can query the data by the document key or the data within the document. So that's, that's hugely important. It's a major difference between document and key value. You can query the data by the key or the data within the document. So document is schemaless. Schemaless, you don't need to know what the schema is ahead of time. Nested data about documents. And ACID compliance, though, is gonna depend upon the provider. And it might be complete, partial, or none. So that's something to be aware of. Data access. So relational databases, pretty much you can use SQL across the board. When you have a no SQL database, even within a family, the way you access the data is gonna be dependent upon the provider. So MongoDB has JavaScript and other options as well. One of the main ones is JavaScript. And then Couchbase has Nickel, which is their SQL for JSON, very powerful. And they have other options for inserting, updating, deleting data. So here's actually some MongoDB code right here where we're actually inserting two quotes, one from Star Wars, Yoda's do or do not, there is no try, and Cassandra from the librarians, math and magics, I like it. And it's db.quotes.insert many. So very, very different from SQL. This is JavaScript here. And we're retrieving with db.quotes.find. So JavaScript, and this is actually just a screenshot of actually some MongoDB code where you actually inserted the rows, got back the keys. If you can see the keys where it says object ID, they have no business meaning in this case. And then this is actually a case where we're retrieving all of the quotes. Document databases are very popular for OLTP and other things such as Customer 360 and Internet of Things. For me, what I have seen is if you're doing OLTP, it's either relational or document. In most cases, again, if you're doing OLTP, either relational or document databases are gonna be the way to go for that. Here are some real world examples. So Marriott's reservation systems running via Couchbase. Gap has several supply chain systems running against Mongo. eBay at one point stored all the metadata for all their items on sale using MongoDB. And Viber is doing always available messaging using Couchbase. Not so great for large scale batch analytics. Now if you go and talk to Couchbase, I believe they're adding in such functionality. But in general, document databases are not great for large scale batch analytics or dealing with highly interconnected data sets. Key value, has anyone worked with key value? I saw two people raise their hand. What, what databases are you working with? Redis, Redis, Redis across the board. All right, Redis is listed first here on the major players slide. Amazon DynamoDB and Ryok, I believe, 
that's how you pronounce it. So in key value, basically you have key value pairs. But unlike in a document database where typically you're going to be set on it's going to be JSON or XML, you can use different things across the different rows. So some rows might have JSON, some rows could have XML, some could have a string, some could have integers. Your keys might or might not have business meaning corresponding to them. Now document databases are technically a subset of key value pairs, but because of the fact that you can query the data inside the data value itself, it's its own thing. So it's very flexible in what you can store. Again, you don't need to know the data structure ahead of time. Now again, with NoSQL databases, you do need to think about your data. With a key value system, typically you want to strive for a system where you're gonna know that key when you're querying the database. Because you're gonna typically query the database by the key, and a lot of the systems are the pure key value systems, that data value would be opaque. You wouldn't be pulling any data based on that JSON that's in the, the data value or that XML. But depending upon the provider, there is additional capabilities like range queries or other extended functionality capable. So it's very strong with horizontal scaling, speed, handling data with unknown structure. It's popular for things like messaging and chat, user and session data. So several gaming providers, such as Riot Games, have used Ryak to store session data for gamers and players. And if you think about it, if you're a gamer, you've probably logged in with your handle for playing, and so the system's gonna know what your key is. And so it'd be you know, very easy for them to store all of the data corresponding to just you using a key value system. Not so great for flexible querying. So if you are Sonic and wanting to do lots of summing and aggregations of your sales across different stores, key values are not gonna be a great option for that. Or data warehousing with aggregation of numbers or complex data query needs. Columnar, who's done columnar databases? One person, which one? Don't know. Use the variety. Have you used HBase or Cassandra at all? All right. So HBase, Cassandra, and Google Bigtable are the major players. For me, coming from a relational background, and it sounds like a lot of people here have a relational background, columnar can be one of the hardest ones to wrap your head around. Because especially if you're using HBase, they use the term table, and it's very different. So instead of having columns, we have a thing called a column family. In this case, we're using the terminology from HBase because the terminology is different from Cassandra. And a column family can have multiple columns. So we have row primary with column family color, which in the first row has three columns called red, yellow, and blue. And then the third row has seven columns. And then the second row has three columns, but they're different columns than the first row. So that's completely different from a relational database, because in a relational database you have columns and you know what they're called ahead of time. In this case, we have a columnar database with column families. And you don't even need to know what columns are gonna be inside the column family when you actually create the table or key space. So it kinda looks like, like a table that's relational, but it's completely different. And so that's where it can easily get confusing. So for example, here, We've got the first row has five columns, red, yellow, and blue, rectangle and triangle, and then on the left we see they're actually referenced as color red, color yellow, color blue, by their column family, and then the column name. Now like previously said, you don't have to know the columns ahead of time. So here we have some HBase shell code that's actually creating this table. We could call it visualizations. Column family color, column family shape. So columnar is really strong at fast retrieval of columns of data. It's also like many NoSQL options, great at scaling out. It's popular for things like analytics and data warehousing. So that example I gave for Sonic where you're going to sum up lots of different sales from different stores in different ways, columnar would be a great option for that. Internet of Things, great option as well. Facebook Messenger at one point was using Columnar and Twitter was using it for people search capability. Not so great for OLTP. If you got a really small amount of data, just a couple gigabytes or smaller, Columnar is gonna be overkill usually. And you do again need to understand what you're trying to do with your data. This is a case where you really need to know what your query needs are 
up front because the design of your system is going to revolve around that in some cases. So let's talk about graph databases. Who has worked with a graph database? A couple of people. Has anyone worked with it professionally, like on their job? No one yet. Graph databases are so cool. So Neo4j is one of the biggest players, OriantDB, Azure Cosmos DB. So data lives in a graph. So completely different from anything else we've seen. It contains nodes and relationships. So the nodes are gonna be entities like people, products, accounts, and they can have multiple pieces of data corresponding to them. And then the relationships that can also have data corresponding to them. So this example here, we're actually gonna see this in a Neo4j database. So this is actually the character Supergirl. I picked the latest Supergirl for the picture. Shows lots of her friends, shows and movies that she appeared in, and who her adopted sister is. And so up here we have three different kinds of relationships. We've got the appeared in relationship, friends with relationship, and the adopted sister of relationship. Pretty much if you can whiteboard it, you can flowchart it, you can put it in a graph database. There's a lot of flexibility and capability with a, a graph database. So this data will look like this in Neo4j. We've got the appeared in relationship, the friends with relationship, and the adopted sister of relationship. So there's lots of different kinds of things we can do with this kind of data. In this case, Neo4j uses Cypher. So we can ask questions like, who are the friends of Supergirl? Who are the enemies of Supergirl? Here's some of the, fr here's some of the friends of Supergirl. This is actually from a graph that has more data than the previous graph. We can ask questions like, who are the friends of friends of friends of friends of friends of friends of Supergirl? Who are within two degrees of Supergirl? Who are friends of people who worked with Supergirl? Who are enemies of Supergirl? Graph's popular for things like highly connected data sets. Social networking, that's the biggest one that people think about. Recommendation engines, fraud detection, knowledge graphs, asset management. Couple of examples, Walmart is now using Neo4j for online real-time recommendations. So you're going to the website, they're giving you recommendations. Most likely it's pulling that information from Neo4j. And my favorite one here, Monsanto, is doing analysis of plant genetics using Neo4j. They've got an article online talking about all these different databases they look like, looked at, and Neo4j was the one that went out. I'm gonna save it. So graph databases are great for large, are not great for large scale analytics. So Sonic trying to sum up all their data, not gonna wanna do that with a graph database. And not so great for OLTP processing. So I only have one slide on CAP theorem, um, but it's actually something that's going to be important to think about if you are actually looking at NoSQL databases and you could have a whole separate talk on CAP theorem, but if you're looking at NoSQL databases, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, you can only have two of them, and most databases will tell you if they're CA, PC, or AP, so AP would be availability and partition tolerance. So an example of consistency versus availability, so I love to watch shows from the CW like Arrow and Flash and Supergirl, and so in 2014, I believe there were two shows. There was Arrow and there was The Flash. And a huge fan and then I went on a cruise ship and I got lost at sea and I was in a deserted island for a couple of years and I get rescued. If I get asked how many shows are in the Arrowverse, not really gonna happen in real life, but if I got asked how many question, how many shows are in the Arrowverse right now, I could answer knowing that my data is a couple of years behind, and I could say there are two, and that would be considered availability. Or I could not answer, because I know I can't talk to the rest of the world right now, my answer wouldn't be consistent with the rest of the world, and that's consistency. So those are kinds of things you have to think about. Most NoSQL systems are distributed database systems, which means they can only have two of these three. And you'll see that with most NoSQL providers will tell you if they're CA, PC, or AP. So that's something you have to take into consideration as well. So where to go from here? So 
We've got several different playgrounds I've got up here. So the first two are places that already had Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server set up, where you can just enter some SQL and play around with them. There's also a Neo4j sandbox. There's a MongoDB online web shell with this documentation. There are some MongoDB courses at mongodb.university. I heard that their basics course just started a day or two ago and that you can still get in it. And the first assignment's due November 6th and it's free. So if you really wanna learn MongoDB right now, look at the MongoDB basics course. And then CalSpace also has Getting Started as well. There's a great popular book called Seven Databases in Seven Weeks that will take you through the five different databases, families, seven different databases, and theoretically, each weekend you go through one of them. I will say if you use that book, they don't give you any instructions on how to install anything, and especially if you use Windows, some of them just don't work well on Windows. So the book can be great, but not necessarily to go through all of the examples. So I got through this way faster than I thought. So here are my socials and questions. No questions, yes, yes. to HDFS and Hadoop. So the question is, would I consider key value pair to be similar to HDFS? And I'm not really in position to answer that question. I don't know. Does anyone have the answer to that question? It's not something I've heard asked before, so. So I haven't actually looked at trying to store JSON inside a node, but you have multiple data points that you could put data in. So like Jamie, for example, is a string. So I wouldn't see why you couldn't put some JSON inside, say like if you had Jamie and then like Jamie's extra points. And I would think you could theoretically, if they accept a string, you could put JSON in there. Um, you just wanna take a look in that case as to what's the limit to how much of a string that you can put in there. And then you probably wouldn't be able to query from the specifics of like nesting using JSON query or something like that. But yeah, if it's, I mean, JSON's a string. So yeah, I would say that as long as you're within the limits of what size string, yeah, because definitely some of this data in Neo4j is definitely a string. Other questions? Yes, back there. Did you ask for a comparison of Mongo, Couchbase? Okay, so the question is a comparison of MongoDB and Couchbase. So no, I'm not, Cos Cos oh, Cosmos. I'm not very familiar with Cosmos, so I wouldn't really be able to answer that question. Yes, Caleb. Awesome, thanks Caleb. Any other questions? Yes. Let me get to that. So where you'd wanna go for AP versus CA? So, or just versus any of the others? So, Consistency versus availability versus availability and partition tolerance. So that might be a better question for Couchbase. Is the Couchbase guy in here? You wanna answer that one? You come up here and I'll, I'll put you on the mic. Well, but then it won't be on the recording. Thank you, Chris. So yeah, I think, I think in general, if you needed an access, if you needed access to the data, Regardless of whether it was the most recent copy of the data, the most recent recent update, you might you might go with an, an AP scenario. I gotta have the data. I don't care if it's the latest update. Whereas the consistency, I need to be able to get to the same copy of the data, uh, regardless of which node in the cluster and that type of thing I'm hitting. So I don't know if that helps or not. So, so my follow up on that would be is 
what do you get from AP versus AC? So I'm not aware of, I mean, in the NoSQL world, we're always partition tolerant, you know. So I'm not aware of an, of an AC kind of configuration. Couchbase, we would say we're, um, we're consistent and partition tolerant. We're strongly consistent. Um, we, are, we, are, we are quickly approaching a, a good um, solid AP configuration as well with our cross data center uh, uh, replication capabilities. So we kind of, you know, depending on how you set up some of these systems, like, like Couchbase, for instance, you can actually get one or the other out of it. But, but generally speaking, we're consistent and partition tolerant. So I could kind of think of if you're trying to pick between C or A with financial transactions, you're really, really going to want to be consistent. If you're social media and Twitter and you're down, if Twitter's down, that's going to be huge. If, if a few people aren't getting the right tweets, probably not that big of a deal. So, right, right. Yeah, I, I literally liked something yesterday and the account jumped up by a thousand. I think it's the previous number I'd seen was older. So I, I, I would say that it really comes down to, you know, things like financial transactions, you really need that consistency. But if you're something like availability, if you're something like social media online, that availability is going to be really critical. Any other questions? We've got four more minutes if anyone has questions. All right, thanks everyone. And then we've got someone from Couchbase here that's also a sponsor if you have any questions about Couchbase or document databases. Thank you.